Yes. Hello Calvary and a special welcome to you if you're visiting us for the first time. My name is Don White, I'm the interim minister of the church and let's pray together as we come to God's word. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father we pray that you would speak to us now from your word. Please give us your spirit to open our eyes to who you are and what you've done for us in sending Jesus. Open our hearts to receive your message and give us life. For we ask in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, I've discovered this week how much Radio 1 presenters love to brag about whose number they have on their phones, which A-listers they know, because it gives a sense of status and importance. And I'm sure you've had similar conversations with others trying to outdo one another by comparing which celebrities you're connected with. The closer the connection and the more famous the celebrity, then the greater the bragging rights. That's how it works. We'll say, oh yeah, well, my cousin's friend's mum's hairdresser once shared a taxi with Anton Deck, <laughs> that kind of thing. What's your claim to fame? I bet that you have some great ones. My piano teacher went to school with J.K. Rowling and Ellie's cousin is good friends with Catherine Jenkins. <laughs> But all of this is puny, absolutely puny, when we realise that if we trust in Jesus, we know the living God. And if we take that principle, that the closer the connection and the more famous the celebrity, then the greater the bragging rights, then how amazing is it that we know God? Not Lionel Messi, but the one who invented Lionel Messi, not Beyonce, but the one who created Beyonce and gave us the gift of music in the first place. The one who is the Almighty, who created all things, was before all things, who sustains all things. He is the one who reigns in the highest heaven. Now, knowing him, that is impressive, isn't it? And through Jesus, we don't just know about God, nor is it some kind of vague, distant relationship we have with him, as I imagine those Radio 1 presenters have with the A-listers. By trusting in Jesus, we are brought into this intimate relationship with God. We call him our Father. We belong to him. He knows us and we know him. In the Bible, to know someone is to be joined to them. Because Jesus died on the cross for our sin and was raised to life again, and we're brought into this incredibly intimate relationship with God. And that's what it means to know God. And knowing God in this way is eternal life. That's what Jesus said. It is eternal life. In Christ, we have the closest possible connection with God himself. So if there was ever something to brag about, it's that we know Jesus. I dare you to name drop Jesus next time someone tells you of a vague connection they have with a ce celebrity. Tell them that you know the author of life. You know the champion of heaven. You know the king of kings. If you're going to boast, boast in the Lord. Now, maybe you're watching this and you don't know God in this way. What's brilliant is that you can and that God wants you to know him. God has done everything necessary for you to know him. We're used to celebrities locking themselves away and doing everything in their power to separate themselves from us normies. But God has reached out to us. He wants us to know him. And knowing him brings meaning and purpose and joy to life. So why not pray to him today? Ask God to forgive you of your sin that has separated you from him. Thank him for Jesus and how he died on the cross to pay for your sin. And ask God to make himself known to you. This could be the very first day of eternal life for you. And that's very exciting. Hopefully by now you see something of how wonderful knowing God is. And that's the big idea for this passage, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23, knowing God. From this passage, we'll see just two main points. Firstly, Paul was thankful that the Ephesians knew God. And secondly, Paul prayed that the Ephesians would know God better. And that second point actually has two other points to it, but we'll get there in good time. But please concentrate. This is awesome stuff. 
Our first point is actually a massive understatement. To say that Paul was thankful that the Ephesians knew God is a massive understatement because we read in verses 15 and 16, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. That's what the Apostle Paul says. He planted the church in Ephesus back in Acts chapter 19. But when he heard of how the believers in Ephesus still trusted in Jesus, not only that, but their faith moved them to have this love for all God's people, Paul literally could not stop thanking the Lord. When I was a ministry apprentice up in Leeds, I had some tough times financially speaking. There were times when the bills would come in, my rent was due, and I hadn't had, I didn't have a clue how I was going to pay for them. But then so often an anonymous gift would be given to me, which would cover all my expenses. And at those times, I was blown away. I was so incredibly thankful to God. Here, Paul is blown away and bursting with thanks because the church in Ephesus knew God. Their faith in the Lord Jesus and God's eternal life of love was pouring out of them. So Paul says, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. We ought to be blown away and bursting with thanks at the news that there are churches in our area. There's a church in Bridge End. There's a church in Ogmore by Sea. There's a church in Nantamoyle. We ought to be blown away that there are churches in these places. There are those who know the living God there. Think of what could happen there in those places because there are groups of people who know the Almighty. Shouldn't we expect to hear of lives being turned around, relationships healed and whole communities utterly transformed? We ought to be like, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, just like Paul was. Not stop giving thanks. Also, according to Open Doors, who produce a world watch list which documents the most dangerous places in the world to be a Christian, North Korea is the most dangerous place to be a Christian today. And yet, get this, even there, there are those who put their trust in the Lord Jesus and have love for all God's people. Even there, there is a church. There are those who know the living God. And that ought to make us so excited. That ought to make us overflow with thanks to God. Think about what the incredible impact that God could have in that place, having his people there in that situation. And it should spur us on to pray for them. When we get what church is, when we understand what knowing God means, when we hear news of local churches from around the world, we ought to be bursting with thanks to God. Paul said, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Then Paul goes on to say how he prayed for the Ephesians. Now let me remind you how amazing prayer is. It's infinitely better than having a genie in a bottle that would grant us wishes. Prayer is coming to the God who does the impossible. Nothing's too hard for him. If he says so, no one can say no. And because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, we pray to this God of miracles as his children. We're brought to him, accepted to him, welcomed into his presence and precious to him. Paul knew God and he prayed to this glorious father. But what does he ask for the Ephesians? Because they already know God. What could top that? There's that first world problem we have, isn't there? What do you get someone who already has everything? What do you pray for a church that already knows God? We see in verse 17, Paul tells us, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. The Ephesians already knew God. That made Paul constantly thank God and pray that they would know God better. What a brilliant prayer. I'm sure there were financial needs and health problems in the church. Judging by the riots that we read of in Acts chapter 19, they probably faced persecution on a regular basis. Maybe there were issues with the building or the leadership, and yet this prayer soars above all that. Oh, that they would know God better. Because as one author puts it, 
at the heart of everything is knowing God. He may give us all kinds of physical blessings now and forever, but none of them compare to knowing him. All the money in the world, all the health and wealth mean nothing unless we know him. If we do know him, then we can be content in any circumstance, whether we have plenty or nothing, whether we are weak or strong, living or dying. That puts it so well. What really matters is knowing God and continually having a deeper and richer knowledge of him. So how does anyone know God better? Or how does anyone know God at all for that matter? It's only through the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's described here as the spirit of wisdom and revelation. The point is only God can make God known. The Spirit unveils Jesus. He's the one who reveals the Father to us. We need more than just mere information. I could be saying all this and it would go completely over your head or in one ear and out the other, unless the Holy Spirit comes and he opens your eyes and opens your heart, illuminates your mind. We need him to teach us, to show us. But he's such a precious gift. He's God. We might think we couldn't ask for God, the Holy Spirit, in prayer. Ah, but Jesus tells us, doesn't he? Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Our Father is eager to pour out his Spirit on his people. Let's come to him and ask him to do that in prayer. So Paul is bursting with thanks because the Ephesians know God and he constantly prays for them because they know God. And Paul keeps on asking that they would know God better. Then he highlights two specific aspects of God he longs for the church to know better. The hope of God and the power of God. In, verses, in verse 18 we read, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. What does the word hope there mean? What is this hope to which God has called us? Well, we tend to use the word hope to mean this is what I'd like to happen, but it might not happen or even it probably won't happen. So I hope that it will stop raining. That kind of thing is wishful thinking. However, our hope in God is not a tentative wish. It's a rock solid expectation. Like when I'm driving down the M4 and I see the sign for Bridge End, and I turn off. I expect I anticipate Bridge End to still be there. That's my hope. And the hope to which God has called us is a way of describing the destination of our journey through this life. God's eternal kingdom of life, light and love. This perfect world where there is no more sadness or crying or pain. This hope, this glorious inheritance is more certain than the, the sun rising tomorrow. In fact, it's more certain than anything in this world. Why? Because the God who cannot lie has promised it to us who trust in Jesus. The church in Ephesus needed to know this hope that we have in God and they needed to know it deeply. In that city where the temple of Artemis dominated the landscape, economy and minds of those living there, the church needed to know that this life, with all its money and all the idols, is all passing away. Nothing in this world will ultimately stand the test of time apart from God's holy people. Church, the people of God, that's the only thing that will be transferred from this sinking ship to the everlasting kingdom. We need to know this great hope too, don't we? Because we get sucked into behaving like this is it. This life is all there is. When evil seems to reign, when injustice seems unstoppable, when darkness lingers over us, 
We need to deeply know the hope to which God has called us, to look ahead and think of that brilliant destination God has prepared for us who trust in Jesus. And we ought to pray for the churches we're connected with. Pray that in this world of uncertainty, the certain hope of our heavenly home would shine in their hearts through the Spirit, enabling them to patiently endure suffering and keep on trusting Jesus and lovingly serving God every second of the day. Pray for believers as well. Of course, we can ask for healing, but let's not get obsessed with the here and now. At about 5 p.m., my girls will come to me saying, Daddy, Daddy, I'm hungry. Please, can I have a snack? Um, I want some crisps. I want an apple. Because I love them, sometimes I'll, I'll give them something little. But more often than not, I tell them that dinner's going to be ready soon. Yes, pray for your struggling, hurting brothers and sisters in Christ, knowing that they will be healed, but not just healed, they, they'll be resurrected, perfected, glorified. Yes, pray for healing now. God is kind, he's a loving father. But more than that, pray that they would look ahead to God's glorious inheritance in his holy people. The second part of Paul's prayer for the Ephesians is that they would know God's incomparably great power for us who believe. The first part is looking forward to the destination, that's the hope, and this is the strength which will ensure that we reach that goal. Our hope is certain because it's not down to us and our own effort, it all depends on God's incomparably great power. That means whatever you pit against God's power, God's power will win, hands down. It's incomparable. You can't compare it with anything else. We could try to do it, but it's impossible. We could search all creation beyond looking for something that could rival God's power, but we wouldn't succeed in doing so in a hundred million years or more. We get a glimpse of God's power when he created everything out of nothing, but that's just a glimpse. We get a glimpse when he parted the Red Sea. We get a glimpse when Jesus healed the sick, cast out demons, walked on water, calmed the storm, raised the dead. But all that's just a glimpse at God's awesome power. We look into the undimmed full force of God's power when we consider the God forsaken death of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection to new life beyond death and how he is now seated on the throne far above every rule and authority, power and dominion, because through him being plunged into God's wrath and then being exalted to the highest place, he's vanquished sin, he's defeated death, he's crushed Satan under his feet. That is God's power. The Ephesians needed to know it. And we need to know it too. We need to know that it is that very same power that it is at work in us who believe. The same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the highest heaven is at work making sure that you will make it to your glorious destination as long as you keep on trusting in Jesus. Pray for churches and pray for Calvary that we would know God's power that's at work in us. He's incomparably great power for us who believe. We are just a small church, a small group of people who believe in Jesus. We look so weak and pathetic, if we're honest. What impact can we have in Ogmore Vale in the valley? Well, let's not get fixated on what we think is possible in our own strength. Let's be captivated by Jesus. Let's be caught up with him and rely on God's incomparably great power that's at work in us for us who believe. Then who knows what will happen? Who knows? Finally then, nothing would thrill me more than to know that you, Calvary Baptist Church, know God. That you are cherishing this intimate relationship that we have with the Almighty. And my greatest desire is that we would know God better, 
have a richer, deeper knowledge of him, that we would have the hope of God filling our hearts and the incomparably great power of God at work in us and through us. May Jesus get all the glory. Praise God. Amen.